I want to start with a quote from Dr. King. It has relevance to what's happening in providing billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of arms to Ukraine. Quote, when, when profit motives are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. End quote, Dr. King. Now, the original sin of our great country, the United States of America, is racism. It was true years ago when Dr. King was assassinated, and it's true now. It's at play not in, only in the United States, but on the world scene. You know, I was only six years old when the U.S. bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki when it was not necessary to do so. Um, most people don't realize that President Truman was a racist through and through, always referred to African Americans with the N word. He had only one ally in urging him to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, all the five star generals who had prevailed in World War II, just about to end, were against it, vehemently against use of the atomic bomb. I'm talking about Eisenhower, I'm talking about MacArthur, I'm talking about Admiral Halsey in the Pacific, all of them five stars really, really, really upset that anything like this was even contemplated. The only person that agreed with uh, President Truman was a fellow named uh, Jimmy Burns. Now, Jimmy Burns uh, came from South Carolina, and I want to play a little clip that will show you pretty graphically uh, another fellow from South Carolina and what he thought about the Oriental. Bear in mind now that with respect to the Oriental, just this week, Congress, the U.S. Congress, passed a law authorizing a special select committee on China, on the yellow peril. To understand China, mm, not really. Uh, it was just sort of uh, regular intervals to show how wicked China is even though, in my view, China would just as much appreciate and as much favor a win-win situation. But that's not in the cards with our exceptional, with our racist government. May we have that clip, please? It's only five minutes. Uh, please pay attention to the very end. Bombs, many coffins. These are for children. Eight or nine hundred a week. I have lost seven children myself. Many have died here. Though it's nothing like in the countryside, many more have died there. In the countryside, there are no coffins. There's no money to buy them. How did all the children die? Poison. Poison, you know. These planes keep spouting and spraying the stuff, and so many people have died. It seems to destroy their intestines. With this spraying and bombing, so many have died. 
Each day, right on time, the bomb craters appear. Hundreds of tons are dropped each day. <coughs> And we can't talk about it. We can't talk about it because we are afraid of the government. It can be described much like uh, a, a singer doing an aria. You know, that's totally into what he's doing. You know, totally feeling it. He knows the aria, and he's experiencing the aria, and he knows his limits, and he knows whether he's doing it and doing doing it well. Flying an aircraft can be a great deal like that. What's a race driver feel like? One is a guy want to drive an Indianapolis 500 and go charging around there. I guess perhaps the, the risk of, of dying, being killed, is part of it that makes it thrilling. I can tell when the aircraft feels just right. I can tell when it's about to stall. I can tell when it, I can't pull another fraction of a pound or the airplane will stall, flip out, and spin on it. I would follow a little pathway on something like a TV screen in front of me that, that uh, would direct me right, left, or center, follow the steering, keep the steering symbol uh, centered, uh, I'd see a little attack light when we, when we uh, stepped into attack. I could pull the commit switch on my stick, and the computer took over. The uh, computer figured out the ballistics, the airspeed, uh, the slant range, and dropped the bombs when we got to the appropriate point, uh, in whichever kind of attack we'd selected, whether it be flying straight and level or tossing our bombs out. So it was very much of a a technical expertise thing. I was a good pilot. You know, I had, uh, uh, I had a lot of pride in my ability to fly. doesn't put the same high price on life as does the Westerner. Life is plentiful, life is cheap in the Orient. And uh, as the uh, philosophy uh, of, uh, of the Orient uh, uh, expresses it, uh, uh, life is uh, is not important. Got it? Uh, life is not so important. People look like the Vietnamese, the Chinese, and I dare say uh, many people still have the outlook especially if they happen to be from South Carolina, which not only Secretary of State Jimmy Burns was, but also General William Westmoreland, and of course, Senator Lindsey Graham is created in the same mold. What are we to think of all this? Well, during Vietnam, uh, Angela Davis, a prominent opponent of the of the war was was arrested <clears throat> and she was manacled and she was put on the front cover of Newsweek magazine. We got her. Okay. This is at the height of the Vietnam War. James Baldwin uh, wrote a letter to Sister Angela. I'd like to read a very short excerpt. An open letter to Sister Angela Davis, November 19, 1970. <clears throat> Dear Sister, one might have hoped that by this hour, the very sight of chains on black flesh would be so intolerable a sight for American people and so unbearable a memory that they would spontaneously rise up and strike off the manacles. But Americans appeared to measure their safety in the chains and corpses of others. And so Newsweek puts you on its cover. 
chained. I continue. You look exceedingly alone, Angela, as alone, say, as uh, the Jewish housewife in a boxcar headed for Dachau, or as any one of our ancestors chained together during the ocean passage. Finally, I continue quoting James Baldwin. Let me put it this way. As long as white Americans take refuge in their whiteness, they will allow millions of other people to be slaughtered. So long as their whiteness puts so sinister a distance between their own experience and the experience of others, they will never feel themselves sufficiently worthwhile to become responsible for themselves. End quote. Let's fast forward to Memphis on the night before Dr. King was assassinated. James Lawson, uh, James Lawson, who is uh, the epitome, the advocate of nonviolence, he told, told a little story to a few of us who are doing a retreat at the Alex Haley Forum in Tennessee about eight years ago. He said when he was a little boy, his mother had schooled him in nonviolence. And one day he came home from school. He had a very guilty conscience. And mother sent that. She said, what's the matter, Jimmy? And he said, I hit somebody really hard because he, oh, he would deserved it. And my mother said, said Dr. Lawson, my mother said, now, Jimmy, think about it. What, what good did that do? James Lawson became the epitome for nonviolent advocacy, and it was he who invited Dr. King down to Memphis. Memphis was in real trouble. The night before Dr. King was killed, he made an extremely important speech. And uh, one of the things he said was this, I quote, we have difficulties ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me anymore. Like anyone, I would like a long life, but I'm not gonna be concerned about that right now. I've seen the promised land. I mean, I get there with you, but as a people, we will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I am not worried about anything. I am not fearing any man just hours before he was assassinated. I also had the good fortune of knowing Vincent Harding, who actually authored the Vietnam speech for Dr. King, the one he made the year before, exactly the year before. Uh, Vincent Harding was a prophet. He was a mentor. Uh, he would start classes or start retreats or start uh, speeches uh, by singing uh, an old enslaved people's spiritual tune uh, to, to lyrics that go to, we are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world, children of the Lord. Courage, sisters, don't get weary. Courage, brothers, don't get weary. Courage, children, don't get weary. For the day is long. Well, the day is long. And people suffer along the way. JFK, Robert Kennedy, Dr. King, Brother Martin, before them all. I'm going to close now with a quote from Fannie Lou Hamer, also a major figure in what Dr. Vincent Harding called the church run, the, the church led Southern 
freedom struggle, also known as the civic rights struggle. Penny Lou Hamer was a sharecropper from Mississippi. She became the, the representative of the Freedom Party at the Democratic Convention in 1964. She didn't succeed, but she did. And here's what she said. One day, I know the struggle will change. There's got to be change, not only for Mississippi, but for the people of the United States overall and for people all over the world. Sometimes, sometimes it seems, says Fannie Lou Hamer, that to tell the truth today is to risk being killed. But if I fall, I'll fall five feet, four inches forward in the fight for freedom. I'm not backing off. I hold that up as an example. I might see, I might not see the promised land either, but if I fall, I will fall five feet, 11 inches forward in the fight for freedom. I'm not backing off. Let's none of us back off. Thank you very much.